Today's review is of the book The Harbor by Ernest Poole. Ernest Poole was a Chicago-born writer who was very famous in the first half of the 20th century, the 19-teens. He was actually the very first Pulitzer Prize winner for a book called His Family. Um, but a lot of people said when he got that award that the book that really deserved it was The Harbor. Uh, the problem was when The Harbor was published, the award was not established yet. So The Harbor is a book from 1915. The Pulitzer Prize wasn't established until 1918. The Harbor is a book about a boy growing up in New York City, and he lives right next to the ocean. So there's a harbor with a lot of manufacturing and factories and trade happening, so a lot of ships going in and out. At this time, there was a big labor movement. A lot of the workers in these factories in the harbor were kind of festering resentment towards the upper class for exploitation or for low wages or just general bad working conditions. And he describes some of those in the book. I think that he could have done a bit more. I think it could have been a little bit more hard hitting. For example, the book The Jungle, I think was quite disturbing to read. And a lot of those elements that I thought could have worked really well in the harbor were missing. In general, the prose I really liked. There's something about kind of early 20th century literature. But in this book, Poole describes a very linear narrative. It starts with a boy describing what it's like to grow up around the harbor. And you get a lot of his childhood impressions of what other people think of the harbor, the things going on in the harbor, um, childhood descriptions of what everything looks like, and the general feelings that he gets. He gets these feelings of uh, ruggedness and fear with the harbor, but at the same time, there's a magical quality as well. And he makes some friends, and they go and explore the harbor. They sneak out, actually, and explore the harbor. And he sees it as kind of a very daring thing to do. I think one could make the case that this is an allegory, this stage of the book. The allegory is a loss of childhood innocence. And for him, that came with more knowledge of the harbor and what goes on there. The second part of the book describes his studies in Paris. So his mother especially encourages him to go and study culture and get an education. And so he goes to Paris and spends a lot of time there and develops more, maybe what I would refer to as more feminine qualities to his personality. Again, growing up near the harbor, he's used to seeing kind of all these rugged men and uh, dirtiness and really hard physical labor. And in Europe, he's subject more to culture and the arts and uh, artistic representations of the human form and literature and poetry. And he actually develops his own abilities as a writer while he's in Paris. While he's in Europe, he buddies up with a guy who is very revolutionary, very much a man of the people, very much a man who gives up modern day comforts to go and live in the slums with people who are working kind of these manufacturing or labor intensive jobs. And he becomes this revolutionary figure who thinks that even this main character who's getting his education and studying writing and culture, even that is a is the problem because it's not allowing this character to put action to maybe some of the beliefs that he's coming across and the ideas in the great works that he's studying. But the two do become good friends. The main character goes to some uprisings and riots with this Kramer character. And Kramer is a character that persists throughout the rest of the novel. So in the third part, the main character goes back to New York City. He falls in love. The father of the woman that he proposes marriage to is kind of the exact opposite of this Kramer character. This man's name is Dylan. He is an engineer. 
and maybe what today we would call a city planner. But he works with a lot of people in the 1%, uh, very wealthy people, to create an infrastructure or a plan for infrastructure for manufacturing and industry. So he's obviously very pro-capitalism and pro-growth. The main character starts writing about a lot of these influential men and his stories get published in popular newspapers throughout New York City. So our main character gets torn between these two sides. The Kramer side, who's this revolutionary figure, man of the people, versus Dylan, the Dylan side, who very much wants things to continue as they're going, progression through increased monopolies and wealth and capitalism, basically. The last part of the book describes some of the strikes going on in the harbors, and our main character, again as a writer, goes and bears witness to these events in order to report on them, and he gets swept up in this fervor. And it's not only the strikers' beliefs that they deserve a better quality of life, but kind of this fervor involved in coming together to make change happen. So here's how he describes it towards the end of the book. Someone asks the main character, what has the strike given you in return for all it has taken away? A deeper view of life, I said. I saw something in that strike so much bigger than Marsh or Joe or that crude organization of theirs. Something deep down in the people themselves that rises up out of each one of them the minute they get together. And I believe that power has such possibilities that when it comes into full life, not all the police and battleships and armies on earth can stop it. A couple of the issues that I took with this book. Number one is I didn't really think that such a linear plot was necessary. And what I mean by that is I didn't think that the book needed to start with the narrator's childhood. There's a whole first part of the book, maybe about a hundred pages actually, that's just an account of the narrator's childhood feelings living near the harbor. And then, like I said, the second part of the book is all about his studies in Europe as a teenager and someone in his early 20s. I didn't necessarily think that the book needed to start that far back in this character's life. But again, this might have been kind of the style of the time. This book is over a hundred years old now, of painting this portrait of a character's life rather than just a specific event that's going on. So the story is the trajectory of someone's life and the change of their beliefs rather than an isolated event. Number two is that with each part of the book, the character's opinions about the harbor and the people who work in the harbor change so much. So his beliefs and opinions are not really on stable ground would really kind of compare and contrast with the character Nick Carraway of The Great Gatsby, uh, who is a character I would say is pretty amoral. He says in the beginning of the book that he always tries to be objective, and throughout the book we see him just observing things going on and never actually taking a stand on anything. Uh, towards the book we see the ramifications of his decision to not take a stand. And in that, The Great Gatsby is a very moral book. So with the narrator in the harbor, his ideas about strikes or about workers' rights are kind of wishy-washy. They're going back and forth between each part of the book. He finally realizes this towards the end of the book, and it just kind of makes the character more complex, but also a little bit annoying that he's so easily swayed by the people around him. He says, I've seen three harbors. My father's harbor, which is now dead. Dylan's harbor of big companies, which is very much alive. And Joe Kramer's harbor, which is struggling to be born. It's an interesting age to live in. I should like to write the truth as I see it about each kind of harbor. So, I'm not sure if the character realizes what truth actually is about the harbor. Is it just getting an accurate vantage point from each of those people that he listed? 
Or is it something more objective that could be a little bit dangerous to different political camps? In the end, he does sympathize with this fervor and the efforts of the workers in the last part of the book to strike and to better their wages and better their uh, quality of life. He starts agreeing that there are certain changes that need to happen in the society. He's speaking to a minor, very minor character at the end of the book, who the book just calls an Englishman. The narrator is telling the Englishman about his life, and the Englishman, I think, really states the truth about what this narrator's worldview has become. He says, To have had all this modern life condensed so cozily into your harbor before your eyes, and to have discovered, while you're still young, that life is growth and growth is change. I believe the age we live in is changing so much faster than any age before it, that a man, if he's to be vital at all, must give up the idea of any fixed creed in his office, his church, or his home, that if he does not, he will only wear himself out, butting his indignant head against what is stronger and probably better than he. But if he does, if he holds himself open to change, and knows that change is his very life, then he can get a serenity, which is as much better than that of the monk, as living is better than dying. So this is considered one of the first socialist novels. I don't really like that label for it, because I think that the book paints such a broader picture of the state of things going on at that time in New York City. And everything is so humanized that it's difficult to just put a general label like that on everything or on the main character. But with that being said, it is works like this that inspired books like The Jungle, which was about the meatpacking industry, and also works of John Steinbeck, The Grapes of Wrath specifically, which is all about migrant workers and unionization. So if you're interested in those books or books about American labor movements, um, I would re definitely recommend The Harbor by Ernest Poole.